Okay, here's your icebreaker question to get you started this round. When you hear the word plague, what comes to mind? When you hear the word plague, what comes to mind? Talk about that with your group. And when you're ready to continue with the Bible study, you can press play. Well, we had a, an epic week last week where we uh, saw in the book of Revelation where there was a, a battle that was going on in, in a, a, a realm that can only be described as a spiritual realm. It looks completely different than, uh, than our world. Our world was kind of like a, a shadow in the background, just a sort of a backdrop for this epic battle that was going on. If you remember, there was a dragon that was... Uh, uh, big enough to sweep a third of the stars from the skies. There was a woman who was about to give birth. Uh, she gave birth to a child, and the dragon wanted to devour that child, but uh, the child was caught up into the heavens, uh, into the presence of God. And, uh, and we talked about who those characters would be. Uh, the child, uh, we, we concluded it was Jesus. The, the dragon we found, of course, was uh, Satan, uh, even the serpent of old, the one that was in the Garden of Eden with, uh, with Adam and Eve. And, uh, and then the, uh, the woman, it was a little more difficult. Um, we could end up with it being Eve or maybe Mary, the mother of Jesus, perhaps the nation of Israel because uh, she had 12 stars in her crown and uh, uh, Israel gave birth to uh, to the Christ child and, and of course, uh, brought us the, the law, uh, which gave birth to our understanding of grace with Jesus. So um, as we looked at this epic battle that was going on, the dragon turned against uh, all of us who are believers that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And uh, we also saw a new character come in, and that was a beast. The beast had a number of 666 and uh, was empowered by the dragon to uh, do horrendous things, especially to God's people, to uh, Christians. Uh, and what we, uh, what we talked about was the fact that uh, for a first century Christian uh, living in that day, uh, that... Um, that beast would have been the embodiment of the Roman Empire and uh, the emperors that would uh, put Christians to death for proclaiming Jesus as Lord. Uh, Nero was, was a big one, uh, and uh, they were probably living under the, the emperor Domitian at the time, uh, who was also uh, persecuting Christians. And so, we started to see sort of a, a practical application right there in their day of this, this epic battle uh, and this, this epic picture. Uh, last week was, uh, was entitled Epic, but we didn't really finish up with the, the passage uh, that we were looking at for last week. Um, I kind of left it uh, short because of the... Uh, the tie together with this week, with this particular passage. As we finish up last week's passage uh, with sort of this epic picture with the, the woman and the dragon and the child and the beast, uh, and then a second beast that, that is empowered as, as well, we get one more sort of epic image, and that is with uh, the, the Son of Man, or one like a Son of Man, who is going to take a sickle and harvest the earth. Uh, and then we have an angel who is empowered to harvest the rest of the earth, which would be the grapes. And what we see is an indication now, a, a word starts to come out uh, and will start becoming very consistent in the next set of passages that we read. And that word is wrath. It's talking about God's wrath, the wrath of God being poured out on the nations 
And when it's referring to the nations, it's referring to the ones that were not harvested. They were not marked with the seal of the Lamb. They are not Christians. The, the rest at this time, uh, whenever this time is, uh, in this picture, are experiencing the, the wrath of God. And so what I'd like for you to do um, is uh, it, it starts to transition from that sort of epic picture to uh, what we're doing this week, which is the seven plagues. Uh, and so as it goes through that little transition right there from the end of chapter 14 to the beginning of chapter 15, I want you to read the passage and then uh, talk about these two questions. First of all, uh, why are the seven plagues referred to as the last seven plagues? Uh, the text tells you that, so look for the answer in the scriptures. And then the second thing is, what kind of picture do we get? What is the image that we get of God's wrath from this sort of epic uh, style picture that we have that is a carryover from last week? So uh, read the passage, talk about that in your groups, and we will continue uh, after you've had a chance to discuss that. The wrath of God is, is a concept that people just don't like to talk about. Uh, yet you can't read this section of, of the book of Revelation and ignore it. It comes up way too much. Uh, the term is used. And um, it, it is very clear that the wrath of God is going to be poured out on not only Satan and his angels slash demons, uh, but also on people who follow the dragon and follow the beast. And so... Uh, the the question the questions just start to pop up all over the place because our understanding of God is oftentimes based on the love of God and grace that God gives us, um, but we uh, a lot of times learn about God's grace without the backdrop of God's justice and how that ends up showing up in wrath. So there's two really sort of big things that mess with our picture. Uh, that make us be just sort of minimize the idea of God's wrath and push it off to the side in our minds, even though uh, it can't be pushed off to the side. It is very real. It is a part of the biblical picture, Old Testament, New Testament, not just in the book of Revelation, but it's in Jesus' teachings when he walked on the face of the earth as well. So, so what are the two things that really mess with us? The, the first is, is this. Um, we can't really comprehend the idea of wrath being poured out without losing control. Uh, for us as humans, we think about wrath as being a loss of control. But when it's talking about wrath with God, there is absolutely no loss of control. God is pouring out wrath because God is purposefully choosing to pour out wrath on specific individuals uh, in Scripture. And so uh, it is not about a loss of control. Uh, it is not about, uh, you know, an, a sort of a, a rage overcoming and then all of a sudden God is doing things that God doesn't want to do. God is doing exactly what God wants to do. Uh, God is doing exactly what God is choosing to do uh, on purpose. Now, the second thing that really messes with us is uh, with this whole picture of wrath, is our understanding of sin and justice. Uh, a lot of times in our churches, we end up talking about how the wages of sin is death. And that is true. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that as he summarizes a section of the Old Testament, uh, and he's talking about the, the gospel in, in uh, uh, the book of, of Romans as he's writing to the church in Rome. When he, when he writes that summary statement, Paul understands just the, uh, what other scripture writers understand, and that is that all sin does not require the penalty of death. If you read the Old Testament, what you find is that uh, the law does not require the penalty of death for everything that a person does that is wrong for every sin. Uh, so, for example, if I murder somebody, uh, I am taking somebody's life, according to the Old Testament law, then uh, by, by man, by a human being, my life will be taken. And so the justice system would put me to death 
in the Old Testament for murdering somebody. That being said, uh, there are all kinds of things that talk about whether I murdered the person on purpose or not on purpose. And there were places where I could run to uh, uh, hide and, and receive sanctuary while my case is heard so that I'm not put to death right away on the off chance that it, there was an accidental death uh, that did not deserve uh, the penalty of death. Uh, on the flip side, <clears throat> there would be things like, um, let's say I steal a dollar from you, okay? If I steal a dollar from you, the penalty for that is not death. The penalty for that is that I give you a dollar back. Uh, <clears throat> maybe there is uh, an additional penalty that I have to pay on top of that because I took that, that dollar away from you and you couldn't earn interest on it. But the, the bottom line is that the penalty for stealing a dollar is not death. Uh, that's where the, the phrase eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth comes, because it's about the idea of justice, which is balancing out the scales. If uh, <clears throat> someone's eye is poked out, you poke out the other person's eye. If their tooth is knocked out, you, 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 you knock out the other person's tooth. You don't put that person to death. What we, what we need to understand is that God is always fair, always just. And so <clears throat> when God gives a penalty to someone for their sin, that penalty will balance out what it is that they have done. This is where our misunderstanding really messes things up because we, we end up thinking, uh, sometimes even teaching, that if I do a sin like stealing a, a dollar from somebody, okay, that uh, that is a sin that is worthy of death and therefore needs to be uh, covered by the blood of Jesus because I will have to pay the penalty of death for that sin. That is not what Scripture teaches, Old Testament or New. What I have to do is repent of that sin and give the dollar back. Now, as you read through the scriptures, what you will find then, that there are places where our sin, uh, we cannot pay back, uh, even if we wanted to. There are places where our sin does uh, require the penalty of death. Uh, it is horrendous enough, it is um, <clears throat> a rebellion against God enough, and uh, hurting people enough who are made in the image of God that what we really deserve is the penalty of, of death. When we start to put all of these pictures in place um, and we start to understand uh, the idea of justice, that God is always fair and balancing things out, then when we see the wrath of God being poured out on the dragon, on the angels, his demons that are following him, on the beast, uh, which first century Christians would be thinking of as the Roman government who is torturing, persecuting, and killing Christians because they proclaim Jesus as Lord. Uh, then what we see is that as God's wrath is being poured out on these individuals, that God is being completely just, completely fair in pouring out wrath on these people who have done such horrendous things and on these angelic beings who have done such horrendous beings, uh, have done such horrendous things against uh, God, uh, against other uh, angelic beings, and against human beings. Uh, who are made in the image of God. As you read through this next passage, uh, I would like for you to keep all those things in mind that I just talked about with uh, uh, justice uh, and uh, with God not losing control uh, and with wrath being deserved for the individuals who will receive this wrath. Uh, and as you read through it, what you're going to see are that 
the people who have uh, have been hurt and killed uh, by the beast uh, are singing worship to God because finally the beast and those who follow the beast are going to get what they deserve for their actions. Uh, and then you will see uh, some more things that are talking about God's wrath being poured out and so uh, and, and the justice of, of God. So read the, the passages here. Talk about how is it then that God's wrath uh, in this picture is fair or just? How is it that God's wrath is fair or is just? Um, and how should that affect our actions, how we live today? Uh, knowing that God will be fair, will be just uh, for us uh, with our actions. How should that affect us, our, our righteousness, our holiness, our day-to-day -day walk, uh, and how we, we choose to live? Uh, and then I want you to think about people who do not have the mark of the Lamb, uh, people who are choosing to live in rebellion against God and hurting people uh, as well that are made in the image of God uh, with their sin. And uh, uh, how should that affect our uh, outreach to them, uh, our, our actions towards them? Um, should, uh, should we be avoiding them? Should we be fighting against them? Uh, or should we be reaching out to them uh, so that they will not receive uh, the penalty of their sin, uh, which could very much be God's wrath. Uh, so talk about those three things after you read the passage. Uh, I know this is diving kind of deep, uh, pretty quick. I want to give you time to uh, to read this, to, to struggle with this. I know that these are tough concepts, uh, that they hit close to home, uh, and, uh, and I want to give you a chance to talk about this. And so this is going to be the, the only other segment that we have for today. Uh, use this as an opportunity to think about the big picture at a 40,000 foot view, at an epic kind of view, uh, and, and what it is that uh, is, God is doing in trying to uh, get us to live a life walking together with God. Uh, after you talk about those questions, then I, I want to ask you to, uh, to pray for one another, that uh, all of us will, will choose to walk together with God, and that uh, uh, you will pray for the people that you know are not walking with God right now, uh, that are connected to you in some way, uh, and, uh, and pray for God's wisdom and opportunity to reach out to those people, uh, to bring them uh, into a walk with God, to plant good seeds in their life with hopes that they will avoid the wrath of God uh, and will be able to uh, walk with God in this life and look forward to singing those praises, those, uh, that worship uh, of God uh, and being in God's presence in the future. Know that I'm praying for you as well, uh, and I'm asking God to, uh, to equip you and to strengthen you in your own walk uh, and in your outreach to those around you.